Hello, my name is Brett Elliker. I'm from the University of California, San Francisco in the United States, and I'm going to be presenting a case of consolidation. This is a 62-year-old female with a history of interstitial lung disease related to lupus erythematosus. She was acutely presenting with headache, left-sided ptosis, and proptosis. She had an MRI of the brain and orbits demonstrating a retroorbital mass, and this was read by a neuroradiologist, not me, and that person described this finding and said it was suspicious for an invasive fungal infection such as aspergillus and was much less likely to be other etiologies such as a metastasis. She had an emission chest x-ray which surprisingly showed this finding and upon further investigation of her history it turns out she did have a six-month history of cough and mild dyspnea. The chest x-ray shows consolidation which looks like a pneumonia just statistically speaking, but her history was much more chronic. So it was a, of six months duration as opposed to a days or weeks duration. So with this finding and that clinical history, it was decided to get a CT scan. She had had prior CT scans, which were not available to us, but this was our CT scan. Uh, and it showed the same findings on the chest X-ray. She has patchy bilateral consolidation, which is somewhat asymmetric um, and quite mass-like. And then she had these cystic lucencies at her lung bases, which you see better on the coronal images. The key findings in this case are consolidation one, which is the main finding, and some kind of cystic lucencies. And again, that was thought to be due to some kind of interstitial lung disease initially, and she was on steroids for this interstitial lung disease. The coronal image demonstrates the cystic lucencies at the bases to a better advantage confirming all of the other findings we just talk, talked about. So in this case, despite the presence of some cystic lucencies that were thought to be due to interstitial lung disease, the predominant abnormality is really consolidation. And the differential diagnosis of consolidation is broad, but really depends upon whether the patient has acute or chronic symptoms. In this case, the symptoms were chronic, and it makes you think of several diseases. One, inflammatory disorders, such as organized pneumonia and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Those are probably a spectrum of the same disease because they share significant histologic, uh, radiologic, and clinical uh, features, and they are probably a spectrum of the same disease. Sarcoidosis, when the granulomas become confluent, can produce areas of consolidation. Often you see small nodules in association with that. Then, of course, malignancies, such as lymphoma, either primary pulmonary lymphoma or uh, secondary lymphoma, pulmonary adenocarcinoma, and then a couple miscellaneous diseases such as lipoid pneumonia and alveolar proteinosis. So it's good to have a short differential diagnosis of things that produce chronic consolidation. On imaging, there may be typical features of one of these entities. So for instance, organized pneumonia often has characteristic features of patchy, focal, often rounded areas of peribronchovascular and subpleural consolidation with irregular margins and architectural distortion. And that spectrum of descriptions is typical of organizing pneumonia. Sarcoidosis, when presenting with consolidation, often around the edges of the areas of consolidation, you see tiny little nodules and you often see perilymphatic nodules elsewhere. Lipoid pneumonia can have diagnostic features on the soft tissue windows. You can see fat attenuation in the areas of consolidation. But when consolidation is asymmetric, patchy, irregular, or mass-like, always think about primary pulmonary malignancies, and in this case, invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma of the lung. And we're going to talk a little bit about the unique features of this tumor, particularly with respect to CT imaging. There is a classification scheme for adenocarcinomas. Uh, Keep in mind, this is a QR code in the top right corner of the slide. If you put your phone up to it, it and put the camera on, it should sense the QR code, and then you can click on the link at the top of the image. So this will take you directly to this article and another article later on. But this article classifies adenocarcinomas and the spectrum of adenocarcinomas from pre-invasive lesions to lesions that are minimally invasive to more typical invasive adenocarcinomas. So it describes the dedifferentiation pattern uh, of adenocarcinomas from the earliest lesions to the more aggressive lesions. There also is this, sec this last category of variants, which are subtypes of invasive adenocarcinoma with unique histologic features, 
and specifically invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma has unique uh, clinical and radiologic features as well, which we'll talk about. So the key facts for invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma, it has a characteristic histologic appearance, which we'll talk about in a minute. It is usually a mixed adenocarcinoma, but it often has a lot of lipidic growth where the tumor grows on the surfaces of the alveolar spaces. It has unique imaging features, which we'll talk about in a minute. It recurs relatively commonly, but the majority of recurrences are in the lung and recurrence within lymph nodes and outside the lung, while it may happen, occurs much less frequently than uh, a non-mucinous -invas non invasive adenocarcinoma. Here's the typical pathology uh, in two different patients. This is one patient with a typical goblet or columnar cell morphology and lots of intracytoplasmic mucin. And then this case shows the lipidic growth as the tumor creeps along the scaffolding of the alveoroceptal walls and also can often secrete a lot of mucin into the alveolar spaces. So one, one clinical presentation of these patients is what's called bronchorrhea, where they cough up this clearish or whitish sputum in large amounts. The imaging features are unique and often look like pneumonia. So consolidation, ground glass opacity, these cases look like pneumonia or maybe other acute alveolar processes such as edema, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, acute lung injury, but they present in patients who have chronic symptoms where their symptoms have lasted for three to six to nine months. Central alveolar nodules are seen in these two different patients here probably representing airway spread of the disease. And what's important to note is that the spread can go to the contralateral lung. So multi-lobar, bilobar spread, sorry, bilateral spread is very common. Because there is so much mucin secreted in the airways and it can be uh, coughed up by the patient, not infrequently patients have bronchiectasis. This case was misinterpreted by me as being uh, aspiration, probably acute and chronic aspiration, but they got an autopsy and almost all of the abnormalities seen in the lungs was malignancy and mucin production. And you can see the airways are quite dilated here, which made you think of an inflammatory disease, but is actually a malignant disease. Cystic lucencies are not seen infrequently. Sometimes they're thin-walled, sometimes they're thick-walled. This was one patient we saw who had lots of cystic lucencies. And then in our patient, it turned out these cystic lucencies were getting worse along with the tumor getting worse. So we were presuming this was due somehow to the tumor. It's not entirely clear the mechanism of why these cystic lucencies occur, but cystic lucencies can certainly be seen in association with the other findings of invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma, and in particular consolidation and ground glass opacity. Lastly, some very atypical features include volume loss and fibrosis that very closely mimics interstitial lung disease. And particularly when cystic lucencies are present, particularly when they resemble honeycombing, this can easily be misinterpreted for a fibrotic lung disease. This is a patient at baseline where where the primary abnormality was consolidation in ground glass, three years later, those areas of the lung had, has, have contracted down and looked fibrotic with volume loss and bronchiectasis. And this patient was biopsied four separate occasions and got back malignancy, invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma every single time. So this was presumably all due to malignancy. The recurrence of these tumors specifically is, is, is different than the non-mucinous adenocarcinomas in that the majority of recurrences occur within the lung. Whereas with non-mucinous tumors, more commonly recurrence occurs in lymph nodes or brain or bone or liver or adrenal glands. So it's something very unique about the biology of this tumor. It recurs in the lungs most commonly. This is one example of that, and it's really important to talk to your surgeons about this because the surgeons want to resect this for curative purposes. But if you suspect an invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma, look very carefully for other sites of disease, often presenting as additional sites of consolidation or ground glass opacity or central labular nodules. That may mean the patient cannot get surgery if it is in multiple lobes or particularly when it's bilateral. This is a patient who had subtle nodules elsewhere that I was not showing has typical ground glass consolidation in the middle lobe. This was resected, and then nine months later, the patient recurred on both sides with, a, again, what is probably spread through the airways, endobronchial spread to multiple different lobes. So again, the unique imaging features of invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma are 
things that mimic pneumonia, other acute alveolar processes, or interstitial lung disease. So consolidation, ground glass, central alveolar nodules, bronchiectasis, cystic leucines of varying morphologies, and occasionally even signs of fibrosis. Thank you for your attention.